word. Let's, go. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we pray for our brother David as he shares the word today. Lord, once again, at whatever you've put in his heart, um, that's alive in there for us today. I, I pray, Lord, that it just comes out mightily and we just receive it and grow and can put it in application in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. light is on there. All right. That's, uh, our system is making it. All right. Well, it is, uh, it's good to be here. Thank you, Dave, for blessing us with your, uh, with your music this morning. That was, uh, that was wonderful to, uh, hear, hear some songs. Testing one, two, we are good. Okay, well, we are going to continue a little further in Nehemiah this morning. And so you can get out your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter 9 if you're not there yet. And Nehemiah divides nicely into two halves. First half is the actual physical construction or reconstruction repair of the wall. And then the second half, which we're kind of in the middle of the second half here, is the rebuilding of the spiritual state of the people. And so, last week, if you remember, just to give context to where we'll be picking up today, last week, Ezra, uh, he reappears on the scene after being absent for the entire book of Nehemiah so far. Of course, he would have been up to this point uh, in, in the book of Ezra. Uh, but then as Nehemiah picks up the storyline, Ezra is not mentioned. It appears that he stepped away as kind of a leader in the community. Uh, and sometimes we give up our influence for a season, sometimes permanently. Sometimes we have given up a role that we step back into for a season. And that's what, Nehemiah, or what uh, Ezra does here. In chapter 8, he's called upon to read the law, this book, scroll that would have been discovered. And they read the law with all the people assembled, massive gathering, and six hours reading from the Pentateuch, it records on that first day. And then as you read it, it seems that that goes on then for some time, actually, over the course of days. And there's emphasis in chapter 8 on understanding. It wasn't just reading, just to say words, but understanding. And yeah, six hours on one day. There's value in carving out block of time, either to study a large scripture or to go deeper into one particular verse. Uh, there's value in that. There are people here mentioned as teachers to help the people understand in chapter 8, and we are blessed when we have the opportunity to teach. That's one of the best ways to learn is to teach yourself. Uh, and 
in teaching, we have to remember the goal is not to make people think that we were a good teacher, not to always say exactly the right thing, but the goal is, when we're teaching God's Word, for people to understand. And the rest, uh, we just try not to let it get in the way of understanding God's Word. And then the, uh, the chapter 8 concludes with the Feast of Booths celebrated. Uh, Feast of Tabernacles might be another phrase that you're familiar with. They discover in reading God's Word, reading through the, the book of the law, that well, lo and behold, on this calendar day, here we are supposed to be celebrating this festival. And it appears that this had not been celebrated. It, it actually says towards the end here uh, that it hadn't been celebrated since the days of so It's about a thousand years uh, since they had celebrated the Feast of Booths in the way that they did here. Now, it's mentioned in the time of Solomon. Uh, it appears that it was celebrated a bit or acknowledged a couple times uh, in their history, but it had been uh, a thousand years, roughly, since they had celebrated like that. When we read scripture, we come across things that we say, well, I, I don't know if I see other believers necessarily doing this, but it seems that scripture commands it. Uh, and we should have an open heart to perhaps God speaks to us through some of those commands of scripture that we might be tempted to say, well, it doesn't appear that the church has observed this or that... Other people are doing it, or I, I didn't know about this, so it must not be important. Uh, but if we have a soft heart, God sometimes convicts us of things in, in Scripture to apply, uh, despite those things. So that brings us to chapter 9. And interestingly here, the tone changes. Uh, maybe now is a good point for me to just say, uh, yeah, I'll be getting through, probably, it won't be uh, much of chapter 9, really. I'll be staying mostly in the first part of it. And then we do have 10, 11, 12, 13, what, uh, yeah, 13, I think, is as many as it goes. So uh, my time kind of preaching every week this summer will be concluding next week. Uh, I hope I'm not saying anything out of turn that, uh, <laughs> that after that, then it uh, looks like I'll be preaching, I think, once in September, once in October. And we're kind of planning out that far at this point. And so, uh, so... I will preach uh, probably at least one more sermon on Nehemiah. I'll see this coming week if it feels better for me to try to wrap up Nehemiah with a sermon next week or whether I will continue that with some sermons later. Uh, but we're a good bit of the way through here. Chapter 9, the tone changes, as I said, interestingly goes from a tone of celebration to, let's see what, uh, what they're up to here. Chapter 9, follow along with me. Now, on the 24th day of the month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. Just read, uh, read a couple verses here to get us started. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in the, their place and read from the book of the law and the of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day, for another quarter of it made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. Uh, let's, let's stop there and just reflect. So this is several weeks after the last chapter lets off, uh, and after spending time dwelling in, reading, meditating on God's word, the people decide, uh, or the people become more aware of their sin, the sin of their fathers. Uh, the sin of their, their ancestors. And it moves them to a spirit of repentance as they've dwelt in God's word and, and sought to observe it. It's interesting to think of repentance. When was the last time you had a season of repentance? It's a bit of an attitude that we should have with us continually, uh, being repentant of our sin. But there are also seasons of repentance. And it's not just when we first become a believer. Uh, but sometimes God puts a burden on our heart. We become aware of sin that we've been living with that we hadn't acknowledged before, hadn't been aware of before, hadn't to our own spirits before. Uh, and we repent of that. Repentance can be something that we do as individuals, a private thing. Uh, repentance is also something that can be done communally. And that's something we maybe don't see very often. It's unusual for a church, for a, a body of believers these days, it seems to say, we are at a season where we need to repent. 
Uh, but we've seen in church history powerful moves of God's Spirit uh, where groups, where churches, bodies of believers uh, have together a spirit of repentance. And that opens the door to God's Spirit moving in very powerful ways. It's what we see here. This really is, perhaps, it's hard to say these things definitively, but perhaps what we see here is one of the highest points uh, spiritually of Israel's history. If you, if you study their history and uh, exactly yeah, the, the leaders and the people and what they're doing and the spirit of worship and repentance, this would be one of the points or one of the, uh, yeah, I think one of the richest spiritual seasons in Israel's entire history, at least as we move towards the New Testament. Uh, in this kind of specific, uh, this time period. It'll be one of the spiritual high points. So in verse, uh, yeah, it, it goes on here just to, to explain what this is. And actually, why don't we just take a moment and read up through, through verse uh, 5. Maybe I'll include verse 6, and then I'll explain what this is, and then we'll, then we'll circle back and look at a few, uh, a few phrases that stood out to me this week. We read up through verse we read uh, verse 3. Let's begin at verse 4. On the stairs of the Levites stood, and we get a list of names here, Jeshua, Bani, uh, Cadmiel. I'm not going to read all the names here. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Camille, Bani, these, this list of names again, said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Verse 6, you are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is in them, the seas and all that is in them. You preserve them, and the host of heaven worship, host of heaven worships you. We'll pause there. And what it goes into here is actually a long section. This chapter has an interesting distinction, Bible trivia here. I'll be impressed if anyone gets this. Uh, what's, what distinction does Nehemiah chapter 9 have? In all of Scripture, Nehemiah chapter 9 has the longest prayer. So there you go. That's the longest prayer recorded in Scripture. Uh, it's some manuscripts, I think, some versions perhaps say that, uh, specify that uh, Ezra prayed this prayer. Uh, but, but in any case, uh, kind of starting in verse 5, verse 6, it goes on and it gives a very long prayer. Uh, which we, we won't take the time to get to it today, and I don't know that we'll get into it because it is, it is lengthy, uh, but it goes through Israel's history, starting before even Israel. It talks about creation. Uh, and it has a, uh, if, you, if you read it, I would encourage you to, to read it this week, it has a sort of, uh, it's, it's sort of a spiritual autobiography, if you will. And... Two weeks ago, we pondered our spiritual genealogies. Where did it come from? What people contributed to that, uh, to that spiritual life that you have? Uh, are you passing on that spiritual life to other people? And we have a genealogy. We can also have a spiritual autobiography. We do. Uh, we have... Uh, our own experiences that we can look back on and say, here's how God has worked in my life. Here's how I can see him looking back. The people of Israel were constantly doing that. It's a discipline that we should do for ourselves and for the church. How has God been at work in the church? When were the seasons that we saw God uh, moving? I was talking to, to someone here the other week uh, about the Jesus movement. Uh, if you, the, the Jesus people in the, in the 60s and 70s, I guess. Um, we can look back on that as maybe a bit quaint, and there are things about that that weren't, uh, weren't 100% wholesome all the time, but it was a move of God. Study those seasons in church history that you go back and you see revivals here and there. You see pl places where the church fell away. Uh, it's important to, to look at those. Is Israel is constantly doing that, reminding, uh, in the Old Testament, Israel reminding itself of its history, how God has worked in the past, telling those stories. And we do it for our own lives as well. If you, if you scan kind of the beginnings of sentences here in chapter 9, uh, let's, uh, let's just look here at uh, verse 6, for instance. Uh, it begins with, 
you. If someone asked, uh, and that, that you there is referring to you are the Lord, it starts with God. If someone asked you your testimony, if you were asked to give your spiritual autobiography, uh, most of us would probably say, well, I, well, my parents. What would it be like to start your spiritual autobiography with, well, God, how did God move? Uh, and that's how it started. That's what we have here as this unfolds, but the, again, looking kind of at the beginnings of sentences, you see you and you referring to things that God did, but they, the people, how they fell away, they. And nevertheless, God comes back. And it's this sort of back and forth, God working in the lives of the people. They repent, they fall away. It's, this, it's a cycle we're familiar with from reading through Scripture and perhaps reflecting on our own lives. But our own spiritual autobiographies would have that same cadence. God did this, but I did this. Nevertheless, God still, uh, or you'd have that same cadence to it. Let's circle back to verse 1 and just pick up a few specifics here in the first five or six verses that I want to, I want to note. So spirit of repentance, again, pose the question to you, when was the last time you had a true spirit of repentance? What does that look like? In, in this case, it mentions the specific acts that they were doing, fasting, sackcloth, and with earth on their heads. Uh, earth on their heads. Now, that's partly a cultural practice uh, because in, in mourning or repenting, that's what they would do. They would actually take dust or dirt from the ground and throw it on their heads. And I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone do that. It's not part of our culture to mourn that way, to repent that way. So there's, there's partly a cultural element here. But there's also an important truth that I think is symbolized earth, dirt. It's something so humble, so commonplace. Uh, there's nothing that perhaps seems more insignificant in the whole universe than just the dirt outside. As you know, Adam was created from dirt. And I've got news for you. You are made of dirt. Because uh, there's a phrase that you've probably heard your mother say, you are what you eat. If you think that through, that's true. There's nothing in our physical frame that isn't something that we ate, essentially. That's where our, our physical bodies come from. And that comes from the plants or animals that we eat, uh, which ultimately comes from either, yeah, in the case of animals, they eat other plants that ultimately come from dirt. And if you study this on a chemical level, it's true that the same elements... Uh, it's 15 or so that make up 99% of the human body, I think. Uh, I think it's actually 11 elements uh, from the periodic table make up 99% of what you are. And they're really not from the elements, in the, the dirt outside. Uh, that our physical bodies, they're not made of anything very special. There are some really cool elements out there. Uh, if you study, think back to your chemistry class or physics class, there's some, some really neat elements, I won't get into all that, but just take gold for instance. It's very valuable of course, that's partly because it's rare. Uh, gold is actually, it's, it's, it's beautiful, uh, it's rare and it's also very useful because it does not corrode. If you have copper, iron, brass, bronze, these things, uh, they get kind of a, a film over them over time or rust, uh, but gold, they open up the tombs of Egypt and the, you know, the gold sarcophagus. Well, it probably has dust on it, but you wipe that off, that gold looks as good as it did uh, thousands of years ago. But we don't really have gold in our bodies. We, we're made of dirt. And you can go through lots of, lots of elements like that that would be really special if we were made of those. But no, our human bodies are dirt. There's nothing special about it. Um, but with that said... Uh, you and I, we know that there is a difference between us and the dirt outside. Uh, scripture says, Psalm 85, or I'm sorry, Psalm 8, verse 5, uh, you have made him 
They made man a little lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and have put all things under his feet. There is a big difference, in a sense, between us and dirt. Uh, we are, in a sense, the, the pinnacle of God's creation. Uh, but there's an important phrase here. You, God, have made him a little bit lower. Because you weren't just dirt lying outside that decided to become special dirt by working really hard. No, you are dirt, but God made you a living being, uh, and that God gets credit for that. And whereas the dirt outside, it follows all the rules that God put in place for how dirt is supposed to behave. It does everything it's supposed to do, and in doing so, that brings glory to God. It gives uh, the plants nutrients and supports the roots and all these things. We are dirt that's in rebellion against God. God has given us the ability to choose. We have chosen to not follow the rules, the commandments that God has put in place for us. And so in that sense, we're worse than dirt. Right. Are you getting a spirit of repentance as you ponder this year? Um, but 1 Corinthians 15, 49, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, that's Adam, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. There is profound. There's something more to us than just dirt. And just like we bear that image of the man that was created out of the dust 6,000 years ago, in the future we will bear the image of the man of heaven, of Christ. And we take on that image even now. Verse 3, if you you look over that, uh, for a quarter of the day they made confession, they worshipped the Lord their God, and also, uh, and prior to that, it says they read. So that's a format for us to follow. Reading, confession, worship. Let's look at verse 5. These Levites, they said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. There are certain things which our human minds aren't, aren't very capable of understanding, of wrapping our minds around. I'll just give an example here. I don't have anything special in my box today, nothing that's going to make anyone gasp or say, ooh, when I take it out. But I have a piece of paper and a uh, pair of scissors, and I'm going to make something that's a little hard for us to understand. Okay? I'm going to make a a one-sided shape. Anyone know what a one-sided shape is? This has two sides. All right? Is there any way for me to make a one-sided shape out of this? Anyone know? No? All right, I'm going to do it. Okay. It involves cutting it in half. This will take just a moment of me kind of working at this here. I brought along some tape, and I'm going to tape pieces together in such a way that we end up with a one-sided shape. Bear with me here. All right. Okay, and then if I tape it together like this, okay, that is actually a one-sided shape. I'm not going to take the time to do it, but if I would take a a, uh, a marker or something and draw a line and just continue a straight line. I'm not lifting the marker at all. Continue, continue, continue. And then up there and then there. And I'd end up back. It's a one-sided shape. How did I do that? Our brains aren't really... Uh, I, I'm not sure if your brain came up with anything when I said, well, here's a one-sided shape. But uh, All right, I'm going to do one more thing to this. I want you to try to predict what's going to happen when I do this. All right. I'm going to cut it in half, just right down the middle. Start here. 
I'm going to cut. I'll cut along that imaginary line that I just drew. What happens if you cut a one-sided shape in half? Just cut until I meet where I started. All right, just about there. What's going to happen? Boom. Yeah, isn't that cool? It's still just one shape. So, uh, and you can keep doing that, and if you, if you cut it again, it actually becomes two interlocking loops. Kind of interesting. Uh, but this is a, a shape. It's actually nothing complicated. You just take a loop and you flip one side. It's called a Mobius strip. Uh, but a one-sided shape, a shape that you cut in half and it's still one piece, our brains aren't very good at understanding. Mine isn't. Maybe you're better at it than I am. But. And so th there's a phrase here that our brains aren't very good at comprehending in the, uh, in the scripture in verse 5. It says, uh, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. We have that in a few songs. It appears a few places in scripture. We're familiar with it. Ponder and, and reflect that. Stop and, and reflect from everlasting to everlasting. My brain is somewhat capable of thinking about eternity, everlasting in the future. Okay? But how do you have eternity in the past? That's hard for my brain. My brain just doesn't quite get that. It kind of reaches a limit somewhere. Uh, I can't fathom it. The, the, yeah, eternity in the past. Cultivate this picture in your mind here. Simply dirt and dust. Who has exactly turned from everlasting to everlasting. A few verses that I'll, I'll read here. Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever uh, you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting you are God. Uh, Job 36, 26, Behold, God is great, and we know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable. Where did he begin? Well, there was no beginning. How can that be? This is the God that we worship. Um, Psalm 90, uh, verse 12 then, later on in that psalm uh, that says, from everlasting to everlasting, you're a God. It says, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Contrast us with God, this being that has lived for all eternity and will live for all, all eternity, and this frame that's dirt. And we have a numbered number of days a finite number of days, the body that we dwell in uh, exists. Verse 6. You are the Lord, you alone. There's significance in that phrase. Let me just tell a, a story here that might not sound connected at first, but it is. I have a uh, flower garden that uh, is, uh, yeah, about 80% flowers and 20%, yeah, whatever happens to come up. Uh, a bit low maintenance when it comes to that garden. But uh, one thing that came up recently that I'm really not happy about was a tree of heaven. You familiar with these tree, trees of heaven? They look nice in the fall because they get these kind of bright colors. They're often along highways. Uh, but they're an invasive species, and they are nasty. They spread, and it's hard to get rid of them. And so I've been taking kind of the lazy approach to this so far, uh, that when these trees are young, it's pretty easy to just get some, some pruning shears or something like that, just, just clip it right at, the, right at the base. But it's just going to come up again. And so I've done this about four or five times now, where I've just, oh, there's that tree, it came up again. All right, well, I'll make things look nice, and I'll just, I'll just cut it at the, at the base. Uh, but it always comes back. To really get rid of that thing, I'm going to have to get out the shovel and dig it up by the root. It's going to be disruptive. It's going to take my time. Uh, it's going to probably be a little frustrating, but those things have a deep tap root of uh, Really annoying to get rid of, but necessary, because they'll take over if you let them. Where am I going with this? A sin that Israel had been plagued with for centuries, 
uh, since, since its beginning, uh, since leaving the land of Egypt, was the sin of idolatry. They made the golden calf as Moses came down from the mountain. And again and again and again, you'd think they would learn, uh, but throughout their history, they keep falling into the sin of idolatry. No matter how God deals with them, no matter what God says to them, again and again and again, that sin is still there. Until. There is an until here. And that's until the exile. Think of the Jewish people after that. Uh, that the Jewish people that lived, say, during the time of Jesus, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, they did not struggle with idolatry the same way that the people prior to the exile had. Uh, and idolatry, it is something that we can have. And of course, Israel had other sin that they, they were dealing with. Uh, but it seems that God working in their midst here uh, through this season, this difficult season of exile, it rooted out that sin of idolatry. And so this phrase here that we have in verse 6 is significant uh, because it declares a statement for the first time in Israel's history, I think, a majority of the Jewish people would really live that out in their beliefs and their lives, that you alone, you are the Lord, you alone. And so sometimes we have sin in our lives that we, we kind of cut it at the, at the base. We try to deal with it, but we don't put that much effort into it because that would be too disruptive. Uh, this stubborn sin that I, I'm having trouble getting rid of. And sometimes God deals with us partially, in a disruptive way, in a painful way, uh, that actually uproots that sin uh, so that we, we aren't constantly plagued with it anymore. Continuing on in verse 6, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it and the seas and all that is in them. Uh, remember here that we're getting into a prayer, and I'd like to just point out the similarity this has uh, between uh, this prayer and the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that when we pray, we're so quick that our first thought is me, my need. What if our first thought is always God and who God is? Heaven, the creator of heaven, a uh, person everlasting to everlasting. These, uh, these people had just celebrated the Feast of Booths, and that's where, that's where they create these little, they look like little, do you remember the one, I don't think you see them anymore, but the little bus stop shelters? Why don't we see them anymore? I guess we got rid of them, I don't know. But that's kind of the idea, just a little shelter, and they would live inside, inside these for a time. Uh, and so they just celebrated this, and imagine... Uh, going to sleep in this shelter, and you can see out the front, and you can see the stars. Who's been to a part of the world, or part of the, the yeah, country, where you can really see the stars? All right, if you've never done that, I recommend it. Uh, if you go out west, there are some parts of Pennsylvania, you don't have to travel too far, where you see the stars. Around here, you look up at night, and you think, well, I see the stars. But if you've never been out west, you, don't, you, you can't see the stars here. You go out west and you can see the, the Milky Way galaxy stretching across the sky. It's beautiful. Um, and so that's the picture that these people had as they slept at night, reflecting on, wow, God made these stars. Wow. My ancestor Abraham, he looked at these stars and he was able to think, my descendants will be as numerous as these stars. And they're the same stars. We look at those same stars today. That's kind of a neat thought that Abraham would have seen. So imagine these people reflecting on God's promise to Abraham, the beauty and the mystery of the heavens. Put yourself in their shoes. We have some sense of what stars are and how far away they are and where they are, all these things. But imagine the mystery that these people would have felt when they studied the heavens. What are they made out of? How far away are those stars? We don't know. Uh, it would have been a mystery to them, but I think it would have brought in them a spirit of worship. And how much more for us as we study the heavens that God created? That uh, now we understand the universe. It's so much bigger than anyone ever thought. Uh, 
that these people had a concept of, well, we think that maybe this is how big the world is. No, no, no. Millions of times bigger. Uh, and these stars that look like just little specks in the sky, they're huge. Uh, our, our Earth, even our sun, would be tiny compared to them. And so when we, when we study the skies, the stars, the heavens, uh, that should instill in us a spirit of worship. And again, remind us perhaps of how small we are compared to the creator of all this. And in, uh, yeah, in, it describes the heaven, the heaven of heavens with their hosts, uh, with their hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas, all that is in them. You preserve all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. You preserve them. It's fascinating to study what even holds an atom together. I don't claim to understand that. But you get it, those protons and neutrons, and there are these forces that somehow hold all that together, but at a certain level, it's a mystery how this whole universe even stays together when you look at an atomic level. Um, and wouldn't you think that eventually we would kind of get to the bottom of this, where we understand, ah, oh, that's how an atom works. That's how molecules work, but the deeper we go, the more mysterious it gets. How all this holds together, how does matter stay together? Uh, it seems that to me that there's an element of God that sustains all this, that he is part of that power that holds the atoms together, uh, that make up the universe. He preserves the universe. And there's a sense also of uh, that God preserves through, through nature. Another thing that we're more keenly aware of than the people of Israel are, or were at this time, is the balance that God has put in nature around us. Uh, just yesterday, looking outside, and I got to see a spotted lantern fly. And I think just uh, shortly before that, I'd seen a stink bug, and I'm uh, pulling out this tree of heaven, and these are all invasive species that came from other parts of the world. But the way God set up the world, there's an incredible balance to it, uh, that these, the amount of water that's here, the heat, the, uh, the cold, the species that rely on each other. It's, it's a balance, and God preserves all that. We sometimes go in and mess it up. Uh, but uh, that, that preserving power of God uh, that we see in his creation. So the spirit that I want you to, to be in this morning, and as, as we close here, is a spirit of understanding the vastness of God, and that we are simply dirt. Maybe if no one's watching and you're feeling repentant, put a little dirt on your head this week. Uh, that might feel silly, but it's a, it's a reminder. This dirt, this dust, it's uncomfortable to even have on me. That's the stuff that I'm made of. But God has put his spirit in me. He's breathed the breath of life. And he has been working throughout history to redeem this race. And I'm part of that story. Let's pray. God, we're filled with awe at who you are, at the creation that you've made. And it's in the spirit that, uh, of, that we saw in the people of Israel in this text, the spirit of repentance and worship that we enter into as we reflect on who you are and who we are. God, we're really just dirt. There's nothing about our bodies that is permanent, that is really that incredible, other than that you have put life into them. And so we worship you for who you are, from everlasting to everlasting. And God, I know we can't understand it, but I pray that we can try, and as we, as we grow in our understanding of, of who you are and your power, your majesty, we'll grow in appreciation for that, and that will be translated into lives of obedience where we desire to serve uh, such a powerful, awesome God. Instill in us that spirit of worship, instill in us a spirit of repentance as we reflect on how we've rebelled against that awesome creator. We can be truly sorry for our sins, for the sins of our fathers, our ancestors. Recognize our own iniquity, our need for salvation, and just how wonderful it is to have a loving God that extends salvation to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
But when the kindness, the love of God toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And uh, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, and I pray that as we go out this week. And uh, I pray that in Jesus' name. And uh, if you could bear with me one moment, I have a joke about dirt. There were scientists who said that they could create just like God did, and they knew they could. So God said, okay, he was up to the challenge. So they each got some dirt, and God said, uh-uh, get your own dirt. <laughs> On that note, have a great week.